What about brain function? You've mentioned a, a couple of times that the dosing for um, various aspects of brain function and cognition may be different to the dosing that we would use for um, increasing creatine levels in muscle tissue. What's the latest with regards to the role of, of creatine in our brain? Yeah, I think this is why creatine has become so popular all of a sudden, the brain and uh, the bone effects. So about a decade ago, it was clearly shown that creatine can accumulate in the brain. It can get past the blood-brain barrier. It's not very really easily. Um, and it can still accumulate. And, and again, a lot of uh, viewers may not know this, but the brain actually makes its own creatine, just like the liver. So the brain says, hey, wait a minute, I'm making my own creatine. I don't like a lot of things getting in past the endothelial cells in the blood brain barrier. So maybe it's going to need a higher dose. And sure enough, there's probably only been 13 studies to my count that have looked at creatine and measuring brain creatine content. Um, and there's two schools of thought. You need a much higher dose, about 20 grams. Um, or you can take a lower dose, as we've talked about, but it seems like you need it for months on end. And probably based on endogenous synthesis or that blood-brain barrier, maybe you need higher dosages or longer to accumulate in the brain. And that's why a lot of the studies on brain are so interesting. Um, these individuals that may be having um, concussion or depression um, or maybe now looking at creatine to help as a one potential uh, strategy to overcome some of these ailments. So I think the brain is the hottest topic. Uh, we published a really elegant review this year um, looking at all the studies that have looked at it from first getting in the brain and then on concussion, depression, neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's, um, multiple uh, sclerosis. So it, there's a huge area. My guess is the next 20 or 30 years will primarily be focused on cognitive or brain effects. Why do you think a, a higher dose is required in order to, to get brain levels of creatine to increase? Is it that the creatine that we ingest first and foremost has to saturate muscle cells and it's only once those are saturated that there's enough creatine available to go across the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, you're one of the rare that kind of gets it when that I, I usually am interested when people sort of say, why does it take more? But you, you've hit the nail on the head. So remember, 95 percent of the creatine that we either synthesize or uh, ingest will go and be stored in your muscle. So the argument is, well, geez, you're going to have trickle amounts going to other tissues such as the brain. And so that maybe that's why we needed higher dosages. And then you would further argue, wow, the brain is very protective. It doesn't like the allow creatine in because it makes its own. So maybe that's why it only seems to be effective in compromised populations such as sleep deprivation, hypoxia, or depression, or concussion. A common denominator, when you look at the studies that have the magnets to measure brain creatine, a common denominator in those studies is that those clinical populations have reduced creatine stores compared to healthy controls. So maybe creatine is just being allowed to come in because the brain says, I need your help or it's just bringing levels back up to normal. What I would hope is it elevates it more because the brain tissue, just like your muscle, uses creatine to maintain ATP, but it also seems to reduce inflammation. And one of the things you would speculate with traumatic brain injury, concussion, is the brain is kind of inflamed. Um, so one of the main mechanisms in the brain is reducing oxidative stress or inflammation. So uh, there's some elegant labs in the world, Serge Ostiak in Norway, Bruno Gualiano and Hamilton Rochelle in Brazil, uh, they're, they're doing some phenomenal research trying to look at the clinical aspects uh, of creatine. Yeah, I've had Hamilton uh, Rochelle on, on the show once before. He's a bit of a, a crowd favorite. What can we make? Is there any significance um, in, the, in the fact that vegetarians and vegans, if I'm correct, tend to have the same levels of brain creatine to omnivores but have half or less the the level of of creatine in in muscle cells yeah and that was clearly shown with hamilton and bruno's study so i love that segue because the theory is well how is it different and i'm like well it's quite different we now know that if you just like have vegetarians versus an omnivore the vegetarians have way lower creatine in their muscle 
but you would also speculate why isn't it that it must be the same in the brain and it's not. So that blood-brain barrier is very protective. And remember, the vegan brain and the omnivore brain is producing creatine. So it is interesting that the muscle is totally different. The brain levels seem to be very stable across uh, habitual dietary preference, whereas the muscle is not. And then again, that opens the door. Is it different in bone? We don't know that as well. Is there any significance to the the form of creatine in our body or, or how it's stored. My understanding is that some of it is bound to phosphate and then some of the, the creatine is, is free creatine. Is, is there any significance to that and, and differences between um, different populations or people that are healthy or unhealthy? Yeah, the amount of creatine coming in or synthesized uh, is basically into two things. So when you hear total creatine, it's this phosphorylated compound and then, of course, you have free creatine. And actually, it's a reversible uh, uh, equation or reaction that occurs in two areas of the cell, the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. And they just reverse based on activity or diet and things like that. And um, about 66% of creatine is in the form of fossil creatine. And the remaining third is free creatine. And they can cycle back and forth. But it's the fossil creatine that we're really focused on because it donates that phosphate group, if you will, to maintain ATP during exercise. If we're thinking about trying to increase creatine levels in the brain, I've I've read a, a few people um, who have written about this that seem to suggest that um, glycosiamine, I think I think that's how you pronounce it, a precursor to creatine, this this might be a more effective way of increasing brain creatine. Is that true or something that you've come across? Yeah, it's guanidino acetate uh, or citic acid is GAA. And uh, a good colleague of mine has kind of pioneered this with a patent. And they've shown that these precursors can sort of squeak through the blood brain barrier. Uh, they resemble creatine. So that's why they're allowed to get through the doorway. Um, and they seem to be able to squeak through uh, and accumulate a little bit easier. The argument is, well, the brain will make creatine and may not make this analog. So that's why it's allowed to be taken in and it can have some beneficial effects. So there's some preliminary data to suggest that as well. But we don't know if it improves performance um, or has the health outcome measures the same. Uh, so they need to have some comparison studies with that as well. So where are you at today, I guess, with regards to, to maybe, if you don't mind commenting, your own personal kind of dosing strategy for creatine is that based off of the literature looking at muscle mass and um, bone health and the kind of 0.1 or 0.14 grams per kilogram that we spoke about before or are you also seeing signal in the literature looking at cognition and, and long-term brain health in some of these you know studies where it seems that you, you need to use a higher dose yeah, and it's changed, you know, before we knew about the bone and brain and even the, the immune system, um, it was simply three to five grams a day. And of course, everybody was happy and it was, you're getting a lot of benefits. And then you look at the, as I get older and the population gets older, the bone uh, importance, and then of course the brain. And so when I did the math, three to five grams for muscle, about eight to 10 for bone, and then on average is about 20 or longer. So I've been taking about 10 grams a day for the last two years. I also take that for potentially some of the anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, when you go to these aging sarcopenia conferences, one of the big hallmarks of aging is this uh, chronic low-grade inflammation we're having all day. And I think as we get older, we say, geez, my aches and pains are, are there and um, compared to a younger individual. So I take about 10 grams a day. Um, mm. I can take even more. And of course, if I have an excess, I might just excrete it uh, in my urine. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with that. But the days that you forget or whichever, it's uh, it accumulates. Um, the other thing is, once the muscle is saturated, it probably takes at least a month for those levels to come back to baseline. And I've talked to some brain researchers and we theorize it's five weeks in the brain. Um, so if you go on vacation or you miss your creatine, you know, you don't have a freak out. Uh, you could either have a serving of seafood or, or uh, red meat, or it's still going to be there. Activity will help maintain that because it helps maintain type 2 muscle fibers. Uh, so that's some of the interesting things. And the other nice thing with this is the timing is irrelevant. You can take creatine at any time of the day. 
I wouldn't go any lower than one gram servings because in 1992, that dose just wasn't high enough to accumulate in the blood. I think maybe three is probably the lowest amount, maybe even two. You can break that up into multiple servings throughout the day, um, or you can take it in one bolus. So it's not like, it, it's probably similar in theory to protein, but you need so much protein throughout the day, you're always conscious of it. I think creatine is something that you can just sort of take um, the consistency is there um, multiple times a day, once a day, whichever you like, and, and see the effects. Is there a, a clinical indication or is the research too preliminary for going above 10 grams a day towards that 20 grams a day for particular cognitive benefits? Is there a way for people to know if someone's listening and thinking, okay, my brain makes creatine but I want to know if it's making enough. Am I someone who has you know, suboptimal levels of creatine in my brain and therefore I would benefit from having a 20 gram a day dose such that I would saturate my muscle cells and then hopefully increase brain creatine as well? No, as it stands right now, it's all speculation um, based on kind of extrapolating pieces of the puzzle. So individuals unfortunately can be born with grain deficiency uh, syndrome and, and those individuals respond very well to a small dose. But we just published a study this year looking at dosing 10 grams versus 20 on cognitive performance. We saw no difference between the dosages, but these were in young, healthy individuals. So my thought on cognition has changed a bit. If you're a healthy individual, adequate sleep, you're not having any major stressors in your life, I don't think you're going to experience any benefits from creatine. The studies that seem to show benefits are in those that are sleep deprived. Maybe jet lag would fall into that category as well. Uh, hypoxia or chronic uh, conditions such as um, maybe concussion syndrome. Those are the things that we think might have some application. But for the healthy person, they say, geez, I sleep well, um, my weight is stable, I can exercise. I don't think you're going to get any noticeable effects. It's kind of only in clinical populations. And to that point, only in certain ones. We're not seeing any benefits in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. We see some in muscular dystrophy in young boys with that condition. Uh, we don't really see any in people with multiple sclerosis either. Maybe long-term clinical trials have to be there. It is showing some promise in people with diagnosed depression. And again, a clinical marker there is that they have reduced creatine stores in certain areas of the brain. Uh, and then when creatine is given in combination with medication, no study has ever looked at creatine uh, without medication. So that's really important. And never come off your medication for those listening. Always get medical clearance. Uh, creatine has been shown to have some small favorable effects in anxiety and depression. Um, so those are the areas that are emerging and there's only been one study in children with concussion um, and that's an area that uh, seems to be the biggest focus. How are they measuring the creatine stores in the, the brain in those studies? I'm assuming that's not something that you can, you can access. It's kind of like an MRI for the brain, magnetic uh, resonance spectroscopy. There's only a few uh, universities that have the magnet. It's super expensive. And that's how you would measure this. Uh, you're not going to do the brain biopsy, so that's how you measure the, the uptake. And, and that's a, a, another big area. Just like muscle, we kind of always want to know how much you have to start with. So maybe some of the variability in these studies is we don't know how much you have to start in the brain. We don't know the rate that it's naturally making it. Um, so that's why I think the next 20 or 30 years, we'll have to focus on advanced technology in the brain. And then we got to look at the areas of the brain, the white matter and the gray matter. Is there differences? Is there differences in healthy people versus um, head trauma or depression? Those, are, I, I, again, I think it's going to be the huge focal area, and hopefully, more uh, uh, money is put into research funding in those areas. When it comes to gut health, I couldn't find a supplement that did it all. So I formulated one with gastroenterologist, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. It's called Daily Microbiome Nutrition or DMN by 38 Terra. And to our knowledge, it is the most complete prebiotic formula on the market today. We built DMN to support a healthy, diverse microbiome, which we now know plays a critical role in everything from digestion to immunity, metabolism, and even brain health. 
What sets DMN apart is that it contains clinically proven doses of ingredients like actazine and solanol, and it's a very concentrated source of polyphenols, all conveniently combined to nourish your gut bacteria and promote true microbial diversity. No artificial sweeteners, no gums or fillers, just science-backed, plant-based ingredients in a once a day, incredibly delicious drink. So if you're looking to fuel your microbes and enjoy all the benefits that come with that, head to 38terra.com and use the code SIMON for 10% off. That's 38tera.com and use the code SIMON to feed those gut bugs.